Hello, everybody. It is 12 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. So today we are joining you guys from our Botanical Research Center on Kauai. This is the third webinar in our spring series. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on May 4th and is going to feature Hawaiian fern propagation and restoration. I'll drop the link into the chat shortly if you'd like to register for bays. And I'll also drop the link into the chat for our Go Botanical Science and Conservation newsletter. If you aren't already subscribed, uh, you can sign up for that and get uh, updates on our upcoming events. This webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending out recording to you shortly uh, after the end of the webinar. Please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A feature throughout the presentation, and we'll hold a general Q&A at the end as well. We'll try to get to all your questions, but if we don't, please feel free to follow up with me via email, which I'll drop into the chat as well. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Nina Ronstead, our Director of Science and Conservation, who will now tell you a little bit about today's session. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to all of you to this webinar. We are very excited that you are joining us um, and there are still people joining in. So NTBG is dedicated to understand and conserve tropical flora and ecosystems from our base here in Hawaii, um, which has one of the world's most unique and endangered floras. And with this new series of webinars, we want to invite you behind the scenes to meet some of the people and projects um, that um, is done by um, NTBD science and conservation staff um, across Hawaii and even in Florida. And today we will focus in on endangered endemic trees. And in addition to me, you will hear from Mike Ofgenorth, our director of NTBD's Kahanu Garden on Maui, who will tell you about conservation work on a rare Hawaiian gardenia. And Julia Douglas, who is a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, actually currently in Mexico doing part of her PhD work there who's working uh, with NTBD on restoration of another amazing plant, Police Gespi Setunuata. So I will just be sharing my screen and start the first talk here. And welcome again. So um, as I said, today we wanted to focus on uh, trees and celebrating um, the conservation of um, some of the most endangered trees here in Hawaii. And um, this is work that I will be presenting now that is largely based um, and led by our uh, preserve uh, manager in Limahuli Garden, Uma Nagendra. So um, if we take a little bit of a step back, we all know and have known for a couple of decades that there is a global conservation challenge. There's been various uh, reports and big agencies um, trying to put up numbers and trying to quantify it. Um, one of the bigger and more influential ones was in 2019 uh, with the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, very long, IPBS for short, uh, who came out and said, um, and this was work led by uh, more than 500, um, 400 scientists in more than 50 countries. And they estimated that about a million species are threatened by extinction. And there's been other work um, detailing this and coming up with the same message, but also highlighting that especially tropical plant species are um, at high risk, about a third of them potentially threatened. And even more so, um, we are looking at island systems um, that are really unique because most of the plants and animals living there um, are found nowhere else on Earth. And this is, of course, due to the um, isolation of many of these islands. <clears throat> so um, in the last uh, couple of decades, this has led to a major call for action um, through the global strategy for plant conservation. Uh, so this is kind of the international guidelines that um, is trying to help us um, figure out how to address this major challenge. And it kind of has five goals or, or agenda points is to work um, to ensure that plant diversity is well understood, because without really knowing what's out there um, and what the situation is, it's really hard to do something about it. Um, also, um, the second point is that plant diversity um, needs to be very urgently and effectively conserved. Um, and this is all, of course, um, both because it's important in general, but also because it allows us um, to use and live with um, the plant diversity and to use it for 
everything from um, timber to medicines and clothes and rituals and, and so on. Um, we have a very close connection with our plants and are depending on them as are all the animals and insects around us. And lastly, it's really important uh, to look at education and awareness and a capacity building. Um, and this is, of course, because we can make all the greatest strategies in the world. But if there's no support to actually make them happen, uh, no political will and no funding um, and no staff who uh, understands um, what, what it's really about um, and has the knowledge to, to do something about it, we won't get anywhere. So um, if we return to Hawaii, um, which is where our base is um, for NTVG, we're based here on the island of Kauai in the, in the top corner of this, um, this map. The conservation situation here uh, is that we have more than 1300 native plants. So that's uh, plants that are found nowhere else on Earth, um, only out here in Hawaii and have been developing uh, for evolution. Um, yeah, and so 19% of those are only here. Then there's a few that, that you can find on the mainland or, or which has come from elsewhere. Interestingly, um, almost half of that um, flora is federally listed under the uh, US Endangered Species Act as threatened or endangered. So that's quite a lot. But it gets even more interesting because um, globally, uh, of course, there are um, other systems than uh, the US list and the major kind of um, well-established list now that everybody's looking at is the IUCN red list. Um, you probably heard about that. Um, so this is kind of the global standard um, on which all biodiversity is assessed, whether it's animals or plants and whether they're in Hawaii or anywhere else, it's the same criteria being used, looking at um, the number of individuals and reproduction and, um, and so on, um, distribution and what else. But what is also interesting is that this is becoming so much of a global standard that it's a little bit taken over in terms of what gets funded or what gets attention. Um, and it also provides comparable data that allows everybody to do these kind of major analysis and figure out where should we really um, prioritize um, our activities. And so you can see these are just examples of some funds that all are saying, well, if you want money, you have to um, make sure that the plants that you want to work on or animals are already on the IUCN red list because that's our priority. So there's nothing to do but um, getting our things on the red list. So we did that out here in uh, Hawaii, especially we focused on Kauai because we've been monitoring the flora on this island uh, really intensively for more than 50 years. So we had a lot of data to do this with. So we red listed um, all the 255 Kauai Island, single island endemics. So plants only occurring here on Kauai. And we found out that 10% are already extinct in the wild and the rest of them, so 90% are all falling into threatened categories under the red list system. So this is, um, this is hugely different from um, the number that has already been federally listed and is just emphasizing globally that um, the problem that we have out here is really huge. Um, so we just published this in the journal Conservation Biology. There's a link here and um, Amanda will probably put it in the chat for you in a moment as well. And the conclusion really is that this is not just a problem for Hawaii. Uh, we are calling for urging conservation measures of oceanic floras in general because it's similar problems found on other um, oceanic island systems. So um, another major thing that happened la last year uh, was that a global tree assessment campaign uh, was completed. So this was a campaign led by um, Botanical Garden Conservation International and many others um, and with the ambition to actually assess all the world's about 60,000 trees. So this is really a huge um, effort, as you can imagine. And what they found out was that about a third of them um, appear to be threatened, according again to the IUCN Red List criteria. So we wanted to take a little bit of a closer look at what does that actually mean out here in Hawaii and how can we use this global tree assessment uh, to help our conservation work. Um, so um, our major flagship preserve is Limahuli Valley that you can see up here on the northern uh, coast of Kauai. So this is an entire watershed of about 1,000 acres that has been uh, managed uh, through biocultural um, restoration um, and conservation by um, Hawaiians uh, for more than 1,500 years. It runs from uh, the upper Limahuli Preserve here, uh, which is untouched wet mountain forest, to moderately degraded mesic lowland tropical forest, um, or in other words, a little bit of a more disturbed lowland habitat but in an entire watershed. And again, let me present uh, Uma Nagendra, who is responsible for our 
conservation operations in Vinaholi Valley. So um, we looked at um, the, the checklist of uh, Limahuli Valley that um, was prepared back in 2012 by our um, very infamous um, field botanist Ken Wood, who's been monitoring almost every single tree on Kauai for several decades. Um, so we looked at this list we had and kind of got it updated with modern taxonomy and so on, and found that it contains about 287 um, native plants. And this corresponds actually to about 43% of the floor of Kauai. So just in one single valley, we actually have representation of more than 40% of the entire floor of the island. So really a mega diverse valley. And as you can see here on the figure, about 65% are endemic, so only um, growing here uh, in Hawaii. And then there are some that are indigenous that could be found elsewhere. And there's a few brought over by Polynesians. And then, of course, there's an amount that nobody wanted to come here, but kind of came here as weeds or through um, horticulture and so on. Some of them being deeply problematic and others just being there. And I was just trying to move my slide. So um, looking at those 287 uh, plants, about 117 or 117 are native trees. And so this means that um, within Limahuli Valley, about 40% of the flora are constituted uh, by uh, trees. And again, if we look at it, um, more than 50% of those are single island endemics, meaning they only occur here on Kauai. Then there's some that occur on multiple islands. And again, um, some that can also be found on the mainland or throughout um, Asia. So um, if we look at the state of Limahuli Valley's trees uh, on the IUCN red list, um, 83 uh, of them or 70% have been assessed for the red list and 90% of those are falling into the threatened category. But interestingly, again, only 19 trees are federally listed. So this means that only 20% of those found to be threatened on the red list are actually federally listed. So there's a huge backlog there in understanding um, what um, proportion of the flora we need to protect. So the Global Tree Assessment Report, um, of course, delivers this fantastic data set of the conservation status of all the world's uh, trees, most of them or many of them done through red listing, others through federal listing or other types of systems. But it's a great summary to start up from. And um, so as they say, well, that's good. Now we have a good idea about what needs to be conserved where. But um, the next step is, of course, to just go out and do it. And so um, they outline this plan for um, what's the important steps to take. You need to be doing some conservation planning and prioritizing um, then you need to be doing in situ protection, that is protecting plants in their native habitat or in the wild, you could say. Restoration um, of degraded areas, recovery of individual species and ex situ conservation. So this would be the collections we would have in a nursery or seed bank or something like that. And again, this focus on education, awareness and capacity being really important. Um, and here a nice picture of Uma out in our Limahuli Preserve. Uh, BC trying to start up um, a new plant in its new home here. And of course, um, we are working with many, many staff across our organization and with partners um, in the area and, and across the state as well. So um, in situ protection in native habitat, what that is really about is um, first and foremost invasive species control. So what we've been doing is we have been creating two preserves um, fenced by, for avoiding ungulates, uh, pigs and deer and other things to come in. So that provides about 400 acres of preserves, both in the upper mountain range and in the lowlands. Then there's rodent control that's also necessary um, because rats are eating seeds and making other damage. Um, so you see here a good nature trap. Um, that is one of the solutions to dealing with rats. Weed cleaning is also a constant thing that needs to be done because they keep coming back as well. Um, and so when you clean an area, it's important to also consider what companion plants to have, because again, um, it's not just about trees, it's also about um, the rest of the flora. And on many oceanic islands, for example, um, ferns are a really important part not to be overlooked. You need buffer zones um, so that there are some areas that are adjacent to your uh, preserves where um, there's still some work done, but a little, maybe a little bit less um, Intent intensive, so keeps things out of the preserves. Um, and finally, we need cleaning protocols because there are diseases, there are seed from invasive plants that can be brought around on dirty footwear. 
Um, so we have kind of washing and cleaning station um, at the entrances to our preserves and, and some of our gardens. So restoration um, should ideally be with native trees. You hear a lot about all these global tree planting campaigns, and there are some really bad examples where people are planting uh, trees without really thinking very much. It could be um, a plantation of pines because um, those are good for Christmas trees later on, or it could be could be anything. But um, ideally, what's really um, the point is to try to get as close to the natural e ecosystems as well, um, also that that has a sustainably long, much better um, kind of um, chance of, of, of really surviving in without human constant interaction in the long run. But it's also really important not to disturb the ecosystems and not to lose um, what's already there by planting new things that don't belong. So um, we got some funding from National Geographic Society and Fondation Franklinia um, to do a project focused on 11 endangered trees of Kauai. And so all of these were selected because they are endangered or critically endangered according to IUCN Red List criteria. So good we got them all <laughs> put on that list. Um, they either no longer exist in Limahuli Valley or the population here is down to less than 10 individuals. And as you can see, they're really beautiful plants. All of them, you may recognize um, palms, our Priscardia, Priscardia palms are the only genus of palms native to Hawaii. There's um, several really beautiful hibiscus and um, the F, the white flower there, is the gardenia that Mike will be telling you about um, later as well. So um, just an example of how extreme uh, at, the, at the brink of extinction some of these plants are. There's uh, the Cyanea cuiheva is one of them. It was discovered back in 1991 and lost uh, to a hurricane in Niki in 1992, which was, of course, really sad. Um, but very luckily, about 10 years later, um, there was uh, two trees rediscovered in a nearby valley, and that gave us a really good chance to try to re-establish the species. So here's kind of how it works. Um, when you um, monitor uh, wild individuals, you can wait for them to set seeds. Sometimes it's a good idea, as in picture photo two here, to, um, to kind of um, take care of those seeds, putting some mesh on that allows uh, or does not allow rats to be eating the seeds. Um, and if you're lucky, you get ri ripe and um, mature seeds, and then they can be collected and documented and registered so that we've got um, a track record of everything. Um, they can be propagated in this, um, in this instance, we're doing it with a lion arboretum that has a micropropagation lab, and the plants are transferred over to our nursery where they grow until they're sturdy enough to get transferred to the preserve and outplanted. Um, and then again, we can't just leave them there and hope for the best. We need to do continuous mitigation of any threats and also continuous monitoring uh, to be sure we are alert and in action, um, constantly um, trying to give these chance the best possible start. Another example is the uh, beautiful white hibiscus waimea subspecies Hanaray here. Um, and um, so for species recovery, it's really also important to understand what does it actually take to get people off these red lists or all the other lists? What does it take to save something from extinction? And so this is really a process where you will start by um, trying to stop extinction. And then the next will be to try to establish um, big enough and well thriving populations that can eventually um, be sustainable and stay there for perpetuity without too much human interaction. But the first step really is to prevent extinction and the federal goals for these species varies a little bit depending on the biology of the species. But for many of them, the ambition really is to get tree populations with 25 trees each. Um, and for this Hibiscus waimea, there's about 80 wild trees left in two locations. But now in Limahuli Valley, we have um, about 620 um, outplants that are still thriving there. We've been uh, outplanting more than the double of that, but um, there's always some loss, especially when the trees are very young. So this is pretty good. Um, we have a third population pretty well established there now. Also, in terms of ex situ collections, um, the goal is to have about 50 individuals represented there. And we have by now more than 1,000 seeds from 29 um, different accessions in our seed bank. Um, so with that, um, we get to um, the last point, which is really about education and awareness and capacity. And here's an example of an article that we had about this project that you can also have a link to uh, in our NTBD membership magazine. And the conclusion here really is, well, they're endangered, they're endemic, and they're coming back. 
And this is, of course, thanks to all the great staff we have here at NGPD, our collaborators and funders, and very much also to you for um, wanting to join in and hear about this today. Mahalo and thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. So I dropped some links for you all into the chat box. And I'm going to drop one more in there. This last link I'm dropping in now is uh, from last year, uh, a little bit more information about that uh, IUN, uh, IC, UCN red listing that we completed for Kauai Endemics. So now we're going to hand it over to Mike Oppenorth, who is the director at our Kahanu Garden, and he's going to tell you about his work with Gardenia Remii. Aloha my kakou. Great to see everybody here attending. Um, really thankful to be sharing some exciting updates today on a plant that is beautiful and important to conserve. And without further ado, I'll get started. Right, so again, um, my name is Mike Opkinorth, um, as well as being the director of Kahanu Garden Preserve, which is our uh, NTBG's garden here on Maui. I'm also a PhD student uh, with the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And one of the really, um, I guess, timely projects that, that we have going on is about how to take care of um, a critically endangered plant. So I'll get started and show you folks a little bit more about this exciting species. So this is um, a gardenia. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the type of gardenia, maybe in your yard or at one of your favorite gardens. There's um, there's dozens of species, and this one, Gardenia remia, is one of three native species in the Hawaiian Islands, and um, it occurs naturally on four of the main Hawaiian Islands still. Um, Kauai on the left, you can see it moving down to Molokai, Maui, and then the Big Island to the right. Um, it's a medium-sized tree, reaches up to 30 feet high, and has wonderful fragrant white flowers. But unfortunately today, it's only known from 82 plants remaining in 18 different subpopulations. Now, subpopulations, well, what is that? I mean, sometimes it's a grouping of plants and that could be a uh, subpopulation in Hawaii could also mean like a valley uh, where it exists, uh, but these are often isolated um, groupings of plants that don't readily exchange genetic material. Um, so they tend to be a bit separated. Um, and like I said, it's designated as critically endangered. Uh, we did the last inventory in 2020. Moving a little bit closer in, this is the island of Kauai that was on the left of the last slide. And this is where the five subpopulations documented on this island are um, known to still take place. And you can even see an outplant that we did over on the left side, Nualolo Valley, um, that we just added to this just to give some idea. But uh, at the very bottom of this map is where NTBG uh, headquarters is um, on the south shore of Kauai, where Amanda and Nina are today. And we also grow some plants ex situ, meaning outside of their native habitat in our um, horticultural center there. So you can see these different valleys have um, green dots, which are where um, Gardenia remia trees are still known to occur. Yeah, sharing some beautiful photos of this plant and uh, different phases that it has. It could be the flowers opening, uh, the inside of a fruit, that dark orange, um, new leaves and flowers emerging from the apical meristem, the mottled bark of these trees. Uh, these are all characteristics that this plant is famous for. And it had many uses, uh, whether it was ornamental or for practical textiles and things like that. Um, I'll share a little bit, but I just wanna give you guys a better idea of what this plant really looks like. Unfortunately, there's some challenges. We've, you know, a lot of times we'll go into the wild, like Nina says, we'll gather material, whether it's cuttings or seeds, um, air layers, we'll bring them back to our horticultural center in our gardens, we'll try to grow them. Sometimes it's not very easy to grow a certain plant and what makes them challenging to uh, grow can be different from plant to plant. Uh, and so in this case, this gardenia has, has been challenging over the years. Um, we know very little about its pollination and um, distribution strategy across the islands. You know, what moved it around from place to place? Was it a bird? Was it, um, you know, other types of flightless birds? All these different things that um, took place in old Hawaii that sometimes these, these animals are no longer here uh, that could sometimes contribute to its decline. Um, but when we have 
gathered seed from these, we found that they'll germinate readily, but decline in the long term. We'll plant them out in our botanical gardens, back in preserves, areas similar to where the habitat was. And um, for the most part, we've been largely unsuccessful. Now, there are plants that we have outplanted that are showing some promise. I think Julia here on this call saw some ones that are doing good at Kahili Mountain, but um, overall, it's been challenging. And so one of the hypotheses that kind of had led me into this study was Maybe there's a type of mycorrhizal fungi, uh, a microbial symbiont that really helps this plant grow um, that we can't see with the naked eye, but require further analysis. So we're going to take a multifaceted approach towards the conservation of this species, and it includes doing a population genetic study. Um, I'll tell you really the details about that one because we've actually gone really far into that part of the project already but uh, essentially gives us a better idea of how the genetics range from these different valleys, different subpopulations, um, as we've also put it. Uh, we want to dive into the ethnobotany of this Hawaiian gardenia. Um, gardenias in the Pacific are really important plants, you know, used for many different purposes, whether it's in Tahiti or Samoa. Um, but in Hawaii, in the literature, it seems somewhat underrepresented. So we wanted to dive in deeper to get to better know why was this plant important in the old days? Um, what was it used for? Where did people find it? What kind of stories were they sharing about it? So um, that sometimes gives us a greater insight into how this plant used to occur in the past. Um, our NTBG nursery staff, so living collections, horticulture teams have been integrating new types of amendments, new types of fertilizers, different media uh, to try to, to take care of this plant outside of its wild habitat and also hand pollinating. Um, Tell you, show a couple photos of that later. But um, yeah, ultimately, with all these types of things, we're going to also uh, do some samples of uh, soil in the wild and try to examine the mycorrhizae from that soil and apply it to plants and see what happens. And uh, the last part will be putting together a comprehensive management strategy. I love this photo, though, with um, just the nanu lei with pili grass. This is actually the type of lei that was um, part of a story that's in the old Hawaiian newspapers. Uh, the gentleman of Lanai uh, put these types of lays together. And so also on the note of ethnobotany, nanu or na'u uh, was documented as being used uh, in kapa. So that picture before that you saw of the orange fruit pulp, um, that was used to dye um, kapa, which is like a, similar to like a clothing now today. Um, and uh, you would soak it in water and you would then apply that to your kapa uh, material to, to give it a different color. The lei, you guys just saw a great example of a nanu lei uh, bowls, like pictured here in this photo from Bishop Museum's archives. Um, even arches of entryways to traditional Hawaiian hale or um, thatch structures. And even the uh, anvil beaters to make kapa were made out of the hardwood from nanu. But uh, one of the most obscure things that we found so far from this plant is the glutinous leaf buds. So at the very tip of these new leaves, it has this really sappy sticky material that's almost like a cement as, as far as how it was referenced. So what it was used for exactly, we're trying to find out more about that now. But the population genetics was a big step that, that we started this project with because we wanted to understand its range, how these plants differ from place to place. And sometimes that'll give us a better idea of how we approach um, which plants we collect from, um, which ones maybe have really unique genetic characteristics that we got to prioritize first as far as which plants we want to collect. Um, but also a big part of this was understanding the genetics of plants that may be long gone. And uh, something that uh, biologists have done over the last 100, 100 plus years is they've taken vouchers from the wild, which is basically a branch or part of a plant, and they put it into a press where they uh, essentially create herbaria, which then go into these uh, really nice uh, uh, climate controlled uh, drawers and they stay there for um, years until we're ready to look at them again. And those are barriers to tell us about the plant's morphology. Um, and sometimes you can even still extract genetic samples from that. So that was one of the parts of our project. We took samples from all of these places here. So it did represent all of the four um, islands that this plant is known to exist in. And we used live plants, which you see on the icons in green, but we also used um, herbaria, like I just described, from both uh, NTBG and from Bishop Museum. And uh, together, this created a really good pool of, of samples for us to look at um, genetic uh, differences of Gardenia remii. So it gets into graphs, right? It gets into interesting schematics of, of what did we get back once we, once we did our extractions. Well, uh, thanks to the help of our colleagues in Copenhagen, especially Christina Eggholm, who did a lot of work with her master's thesis on this, 
um, we were able to delineate some interesting population clusters uh, based on their genetics. And what we found was the north side of Kauai and the south side of Kauai, which is the bright red and the dark red here on the left, um, they were pretty clearly separated. Whereas if you look at the right and that green, blue, and orange on the right side, that's the islands of Hawaii, Molokai, and Maui, which, uh, you know, from a genetic kind of standpoint, it's, it's interesting to see that these three younger islands um, that are actually pretty close together, and especially Maui used to be, Maui, Maui Nui used to be Maui, Molokai, and Lanai, um, and now they've separated over the years, but, um, you know, these genetics are really close, closely tie, um, tied together. So uh, we did find some separation in their genetics. And to kind of further back this up, we did a couple other um, bioinformatic graphs to show kind of on the right, you see it's like a family tree, but we call it a phylo, uh, phylogeny tree. And you again, you see kind of that pattern where Maui, Molokai, and the Big Island are in one group. And then you see um, the north and south of Kauai with very separate um, uh, genetic clusters as well. And then on the left, this is called an admixture. And basically this tool is used to show how integrated these subpopulations are even within each other. So what part of the genetics say from the plants from South Kauai are in the plants from North Kauai, how separate really are they? And so this admixture, you can see, it's not just solid colors, but you see a little bit of black mixed in on the South Kauai. And then you see a little bit of the, um, the uh, North Kauai in there with the South Kauai plants as well. And so what's interesting is some of these plants are a little bit of like anomalies. They'll throw us through a loop and say, hey, it's a little bit closer to this, um, this area than the ones from the others. So maybe those are really interesting plants that we wanna collect from and uh, maintain in our uh, botanical gardens or for restoration. The horticultural trials are happening right now. It's pretty amazing to see what uh, the folks on Kauai at our South Shore are doing to try new amendments to kind of change the tide of our lack of success with this plant in the past. Um, one of the really interesting things to me was they integrated this new um, fertilizer that's really high in phosphorus. It's bird guano essentially, right? And prior to any people coming to the Hawaiian islands, uh, flightless birds were here. There was a lot of seabirds, much more than there is today. Um, for a myriad of reasons, but because of that, there was different nutrients that were, you know, landing on the, the ground from these bird droppings and things like that and fertilizing these plants. And so how did these plants evolve to, to their environment even prior to any people coming? So they're top dressing with also forest soil. That's kind of a rudimentary method of uh, what I'm going to be talking about in a minute, but, um, and they're also increasing documentation. So when you're having a hard time with the plant, um, you may want to just write more notes about what's working and what's not. Whereas if you've grown something 50 times, you kind of know already, you don't have to necessarily make as many notes. So um, with these new approaches, we're also increasing our documentation. But the big question that I'm working on uh, with some of my colleagues is, is there wild fungi, you know, that supports the plant health of this nanu, this uh, Gardenia remii? And there's actually some previous studies that help motivate um, our, our hypothesis. And so uh, a study that just came out by Jerry Coco out of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, he looked at 33 different Hawaiian species, took roots from the wild and um, looked at them under a microscope to see if mycorrhizal fungi was um, attaching itself to the roots. And the answer is there's a whole spectrum. Like some plants will have very little fungi attaching to them and some will have like a majority of that root will have fungi all over it. So you can see these two examples that I took a picture of um, on this X, Y axis here. Uh, the Y axis is, um, the upright axis is the one of how much of that root is being colonized by fungi and the X axis is the different species. So Freysinesa arborea or EAEA, that one has very little, um, uh, had very little uh, mycorrhizae uh, colonizing the plants. And then the Gania species had, you know, almost half or, or more in some cases of that root was colonized. So big question is, where does this Gardenia remii stack up in that? So we went out to the wild. We went to some of these trees out in uh, Kalalau Valley, uh, thanks to the help of, you know, many years of documentation, guys like Ken Wood that have been going up and finding where these trees are still at. Uh, we found a nice mature tree, got permits, uh, dropped in and got um, a small soil sample, but enough for us to get an idea of um, what's happening around the root base of these trees. Um, so that was a really fun adventure to kind of get, get this project going. 
And what we did was, is we brought these plants back to our um, hort center, and then we created what's called trap cultures. And basically what we're doing with trap cultures is we're taking soil from the wild that is presumed to have fungus in it. And we're trying to expand the amount of that fungus that's in that soil so that we can make like a, an inoculant, something that we could add to plants and hopefully improve their health. So um, you can actually see in this schematic uh, by Martian Schultz, in the middle one, you can see the soil and then uh, at the bottom, that um, species of plant, its roots are going into that soil. And that's where the fungi are attaching to those roots. And then what we do is we actually kill the plants, <laughs> uh, the host, which is not the gardenia plant. In this case, we grow, grow, out, grow out the um, soil with some grass. We stopped watering the grass. And then what that does is it tells any fungi in the soil that we collected to reproduce. And it's called sporulation. Basically, all those little fungi create spores. And then it's like a defense mechanism where they can further populate and, and get out into a new environment. But we, we do that. Then we extract all at the bottom um, row here. You can see where um, those little fungal spores are, are in one of these sieves. We centrifuge it, uh, create a slurry, and then we apply it to plants. And the hope is that we can co um, compare ones without the slurry and those with that uh, fungi slurry to see if we get increased root mass, um, you know, better plant health. And we're going to use metrics like how many leaves are on the plant, how high is this plant, um, you know, is there a presence of disease and, and pests on these plants. So um, you may see something like this schematic where on the left side you have maybe a little bit less leaf material and on the right you have bigger roots, you have kind of increased salt um, tolerance to pests and drought. And uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get a better idea of how Gardenia remii behaves with the presence or without the presence of this fungi. And so in summary, we're gonna use these different tools to inform a conservation management plan. You know, we talked about using genetic profiling, um, an ethnobotanical study, um, our horticultural staff doing different projects. And then of course, this greenhouse experiment to examine mycorrhizal fungi on plants. Um, and hopefully we'll get together something that as a management plan based on science, based on things that we've learned from whether it was the field biologists or even guys like me who have a small part in, in doing these soil collections and creating a fungal inoculant. So with that, thank you guys for hanging with me. And um, yeah, I'll kind of just end with this, this really amazing Hawaiian proverb. It's iola oi, iola makone. Um, it is in your life that we all have life. And knowing that all of our plants, you know, um, require things to survive. We got to think about um, how these interconnections can, can help us help uh, take care of our plants. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Mike. Sure. So our next and last speaker before our Q&A section is Julia Douglas. And she's going to talk to you about an outplanting that was done back in uh, 2017. She's actually been going in and monitoring those outplanted trees. So I will let her take it away from here. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen. Does that look good? It does. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thanks for coming to the webinar. I'm Julia Douglas and I'm a botany PhD student um, at the University of Hawaii, but uh, I work with NTBG on this uh, special species, Policia visitenuata, and so I'm a graduate uh, research assistant um, that's been helping with the monitoring um, of this rare tree. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is optimizing the reintroduction success of rare endemic plants, um, a case study, on this tree, which is um, the Hawaiian name is Ohe Mauka, um, and it's in the family uh, Araliaceae, so Polyceus bisitenuata. And here are two um, really beautiful uh, pictures of the flowers on the left of this tree, and then on the right is one of the most successful reintroduced plants. Uh, so here's another photo showing um, one of the remaining plants in its habitat. It has uh, compound leaves with uh, six to eight leaflets and grows in the montane slopes of eastern Kauai. Um, this is another one of the remaining individuals and there's only 26 left in the wild and so it's a plant um, on the brink of extinction um, which is extremely rare and its rarity um, necessitated the creation of some kind of uh, conservation strategy and a, in this case a reintroduction. 
So this is the existing range of Ohemalka. Um, it's been reduced to four subpopulations with 26 individuals in the wild. You can see the four red dots are on the montane slopes of Eastern Kauai um, between 1,000 to 2,500 feet. And it's a single island endemic, so it's not found on any other place in the archipelago. Um, because of its extreme rarity, it's um, designated as a PEP plant. It's federally endangered on the US Fish and Wildlife Service list, and it's critically endangered on the IUCN red list. Um, other Hawaiian names for Polysius bisatinuata are, are also Ohe Ohe, um, as well as Ohe Malka. Um, and so to describe a little bit what a reintroduction is, um, a reintroduction is the effort to supplement the in situ population of a plant um, with new saplings. And so we reintroduce um, plants which are one year old from the nursery. Um, they then grow and hopefully persist, uh, flower, um, hopefully they're then pollinated by the appropriate pollinators. Uh, we then hope that they are distributed, distributed across the landscape um, with dispersers, they germinate and then um, grow anew. And so the idea of a reintroduction is that you're supplementing uh, the natural life cycle of a very rare um, organism. And so to, for a reintroduction to be considered successful, um, you need all elements of this life cycle uh, to be functioning. And so you need both pollinators, you need uh, vegetative growth, um, dispersers, uh, and, and the conditions which allow these things to happen. And so for the conditions which allow these things to happen is overall ecosystem health. You need the forest itself um, to be amenable towards uh, the species persistence. You need climatic suitability as well. Um, and furthermore, in the case of extremely rare plants, you need societal investment. So um, when plants are extremely rare, you need to do multiple rounds usually of reintroduction in order to reestablish healthy populations of plants. And so uh, that requires uh, funding and organizations and human labor um, in order to establish those populations and uh, get the population uh, back um, in a sustainable uh, way. And so, but there's multiple barriers to success. So in the case of Ohe Malka, um, there's a lack of native pollinators. Uh, there's furthermore, there's extreme seed predation by rats on the native plants. Um, almost all of the seeds which the wild plants put on are um, eaten by rats before they're mature. Uh, there's a lack of native seed dispersals, dispersers. Uh, there's extreme invasive plant competition. Uh, and because there's only 26 to 36 left in the wild, there's um, inbreeding depression um, and there's a lack of genetic diversity um, within the species. And so for a uh, at a species reintroduction to be successful, you have to overcome these barriers or at the very least be aware of them and work to mitigate um, these factors. And so in 2017, um, NTBG started a reintroduction effort um, in order to work on Ohimaka, work on this species. And so you can see Natalia Tongalin here on the, on the right. Um, she worked to collect seeds from the remaining wild trees. Um, here's her climbing the trees to collect the seeds. Um, and you, she usually had to use wire bags to prevent rat predation on the seeds, and she um, was very successful in collecting them. And so then um, over 5,000 were grown in um, the NTBG nursery by Ashley Trask and with the support of Mike Damata and other um, people and Randy here um, and other people in the nursery. And so it was extremely successful um, growing this plant in the nursery. And so then we reintrodu reintroduced them to 11 sites across Eastern Kauai. So you can see on the map on the left, the blue triangles are the locations where we reintroduced um, these very rare trees. And so you can see that some of these places, um, we reintroduced the trees next to the original um, wild founders. And in other places, um, they, we reintroduced the trees into places where they have never been historical register, um, registration of the species. I mean, so these locations such as uh, Limahuli, Lower and Upper Limahuli here on the North Shore of Kauai um, and McBride on the South Shore here, as well as Blue Hole here in the center, all represent experimental um, expansions of the species range. And so we did this in order to, um, to understand more about the species biology to see if it would, if this plant would survive in these habitats. Um, and also um, logistically, these were the places that had fences um, and so to protect them from pigs um, and to have them in places where uh, th these plants could be monitored, we planted them in uh, either botanical, go botanical gardens or places where they could be um, protected from pigs. And so here we are packaging up the Polysius bisitinuato in 2017. 
carrying them up into the mountains with boxes and then planting them um, into these eastern mesic, moderate mesic wet slopes. And so this all happened in 2017. And then we had to leave the Palisius for quite a few years um, on their own. And uh, then we've returned since then for two rounds of monitoring. And so here's some of the results from those two years of monitoring. We returned both in 2020 and in 2022 to all 11 of the sites. Um, we returned to every single Palisius plant um, and monitored, what, first of all, whether or not it was alive and then its, its overall size. Um, uh, size, vigor, uh, diameter, and height. And so you can see there's a significant variation um, in survivalship between the various sites. So you can see here in this is the survivorship ratio between 2017 and 2020. Um, there's high variation. So some sites such as um, Ha'upu Summit here um, had as high as 32% uh, of the plant survived or in Lower Limahuli, 56% of the plants survived, but in other places uh, such as No No Kanele Bog or McBride Restoration, we had only 1% survivorship. So there was huge um, variability um, based on the environmental variables within these sites. And so that was 2020, we returned this year in 2022, refound um, all of the plants. So we started with around, we, um, this is from this site, we had 3,700, we found 647 in 2020, and when we returned in 2022, we then found 437. Um, and so you can see that there's more variation between the sites um, in the 2020 year than there was in the 2022 um, year. So this indicates that there was um, the mortality that occurred and the variation between the sites um, was greater in the first um, three years of plant growth and establishment um, than it was in um, the following years of growth. So. In other words, the plants that managed to survive the first three years seem to be a slightly more stable and able to survive um, uh, going forward. So you can see that um, is reflected both in the less variability, the lower variability between 20 and 2020 and 2022, um, and overall the higher survivorship rates. So the plants that we found in 2020, we were more likely to find them in 2022 um, than previously. And so overall, this might look like a kind of a low survivorship rate. Um, going from 3,700-ish to 400-ish. Um, but when you think about this being an extremely rare plant and there only being 26, between 20 to 30 individuals in the wild, um, this is a significant improvement um, and a significant contribution to the conservation of this species. Um, uh, so this is a map that I made um, using max entropy. Uh, Sorry, this is in Spanish, but this is the uh, the uh, um, habitat preferences for Polyseus bisatinuata on Kauai. So this is a max um, entropy model that shows the probability of where there would be good habitat for this species um, using the survivorship data that we collected in 2020. And so you can see the brown, uh, the blue sections have extremely low probability that it is preferable habitat and the green or yellow sections have a higher probability closer to one that it's um, higher that it's um, better habitat and so the environmental layers that went into this are cloud frequency rainfall humidity land cover um, etc um, and so this kind of map is important um, hopefully I need to use the information that we gathered from 2020 to add to this map um, to make it more accurate but creating these kinds of maps is important for both looking for new um, presence of wild individuals. So we could go to some of these yellow or green areas and search for other wild founders, um, or we could try experimentally outplanting in some of these areas. Uh, and so this map or other maps that might be created would be um, helpful for management planning and, and figuring out where to um, plant this rare species um, to have higher success. Um, here's some photos showing the rat predation that occurs in the wild individuals. And so part of the 2020 monitoring was also an attempt to um, opportunistically collect fruit while we were visiting the wild individuals. Um, it's difficult to collect fruit because of the heavy rat predation on the species. So you can see here on the left, the kind of the, the trash that the um, rats leave behind as they chow down on the seeds. And then on the right, um, you can see the, the teeth of the rats as they're testing to see if the seeds um, are ripe enough to eat. And so you can see that they've eaten all of the other ones on the left there, and they're slowly going along, testing them with their teeth um, until they're ripe enough to eat. And so this is the main problem that is, um, we hypothesize has caused the decline of this species. Um, it's just the extreme rat predation. Uh, one tree might produce anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 seeds in a season. Um, and absolutely everyone will be um, eaten by rats. And so there's just no um, natural regeneration or germination of this species. 
And so here's um, us trying to collect some of the seeds. And so to prevent rat predation, we cover them in um, double wire baggies. Um, some of the, well, sometimes the rats can chew through the single wire baggies here on the right, uh, but on the left, we started trying to do double baggies or Natalia in 2017 would use kind of a thicker wire that would prevent rat predation and allow the seeds a chance to mature um, and ripen so that we could return a month later and collect them. And so at a few sites, um, we had success in 2022 this year collecting seeds. Um, they were able to ripen within their wire baggies and we returned um, to collect them. And the fate of these seeds is some of them will go to the seed bank at NTBG, some of them will go to the seed bank at Lion Arboretum on Oahu. Um, then the final portion will be grown in NTBG um, for planting perhaps in re reintroduction sites or perhaps in um, within the gardens. And of course, the um, the goal of re-monitoring is trying to understand where we can plant them, that we will have higher success of reintroduction. Um, and so hopefully using the data from both 2020 and 2022, um, we can optimize uh, the selection of sites. And so we can have higher um, survivorship rates. Um, and so here's a picture of one of the um, outplants from this year. Um, the average height for that plants at this point is about waist high and slightly more than one centimeter in diameter. So they're slow growing and they're still saplings, um, but it's extremely heartening that there's now about 430-ish um, in the wild, which is a great addition um, to the populations of these rare species. Um, and so you can see the, the um, see this plant is doing fairly well here at this reintroduction site. And so one of the most exciting um, elements of re of uh, remonitoring the trees this year, we're seeing um, that four individuals of the 400 have created um, buds and so they're becoming reproductive. And so this is extremely heartening to realize that this extremely endangered plant, um, uh, the effort that went into collecting the seeds, growing them in the greenhouse by all of the staff, outplanting them by staff and collaborators, and then um, further monitoring has now resulted in a few of them beginning to reproduce. Um, and so this is, shows that this, uh, the reintroduction is moving to the next step of the life cycle, um, that now some of the reintroduced plants are moving into the reproductive stage. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll set seed. Um, and the dream would be that they would then disperse across the landscape and uh, little by little, uh, establish a sustainable population. And so this was the best part of the 2022 monitoring for sure was to see those four plants um, with flower buds. So to say thank you to some of the people who helped in the monitoring this season, it was a multi-agency effort with USGS, for, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and PEP. Um, here are some of the people who helped a lot, which were Natalia Tanglin, uh, Jordan Gus, Randy Umetsu and Kevin Hoek. Um, thank you also to Nina uh, Ronstand and to Mike Damata, who um, were the NTBG supporters of this project. Um, so here's some more pictures of all the different people who helped in the field, um, all the different collaborators with uh, Scott Heinzman here and Susan Deans, Lucas Fortini from USGS, um, Michelle Clark from um, the Fish and Wildlife Service and Uma, um, Kevin and Matt from, and Jordan from um, NTBG. Uh, thank you also to the Upper Lima Huli crew who helped re-monitor this year. Here's also Chi and Merlin who assisted and um, Marcus Collado. And Liz was a contributor. Here on the right is Stephanie um, Jelinek who also contributed. Um, John Steinhorst also helped monitor um, the plants and Emily Sailing as well. Here you can see them with two um, particularly vigorous looking out plantings. Um, and here's Fair and uh, Matt also with uh, some really nice looking plants. The plant on the right is actually doing fine. It's just kind of um, assuming this crawling habit down the slope, um, but it's doing okay. That's how it's, it decided to grow. Uh, thanks also to Cassie uh, who came and helped with uh, Cassandra Jensen who came and helped with the outplant or the remonitoring this year. Um, and so that's all that I have uh, for my part of the presentation. And I'll be happy to take questions. But um, yeah, thank you to NTBG for, uh, and USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service for funding this project. And it's been really exciting to go and visit all of the trees um, every few years and see how they're doing.